In this new video format, I will tell you about the basics of reverse engineering and more general concepts. In the very first video, I will cover firmware reverse engineering and how I got into reverse engineering. My story about reverse engineering is pretty interesting. It actually started with open source. And I was only 13 years old when the father of a friend told me, hey, you seem to like those computer things. Why don't you go to the Linux user group in your city? So I visited those people at the Linux user group and soon I became something like an open source software evangelist. I told everyone, hey, Deviant is really great. You have to try Slackware, you have to try Gen2 whatsoever. It is really the best software ever and it is open source. Meanwhile, I would no longer say people, hey, you have to use this or that. But I'm more like an open source evangelist, so to say. That means I own all the products from Apple, but more for the purpose of reverse engineering them and understanding how they work. Back in the day, I was pretty much the hacker stereotype. That means I had a ThinkPad, of course, and I was running TaxRacer on it. Well, with TaxRacer, everything was good unless I wanted to use the accelerometer because that had swapped access on my particular ThinkPad. And I think this is the only kernel patch I ever wrote back in the day where I swapped the access only for my ThinkPad so that I could run TaxRacer with the accelerometer. And this is the proof for most of the open source project. There's like one or two maintainers, there's only very few patches. People don't really contribute, even though you could. So it is open source, you could read the source, people could audit it, but there is only very few doing so. I visited a special school in that I was learning some C and Java basics. I was also learning assembly and I pretty much enjoyed assembly. You might not say, yeah, why? But you know, I had to program on paper in the exams. So I really liked about assembly that you had like a few instructions. We even had some cheat sheet for this. And I could just, yeah, remember what I had to do. Whereas C, you have random libraries, random stuff to remember. So I thought, hey, assembly is much easier. I even went so far that I wrote a whole DCF77 receiver in assembly. DCF77 is a signal that is being sent to synchronize watches and their time. So you have a peak once a second and the peak can either be like short or long. And depending on this, there is a one or a zero transmitted and also the second is synchronized. This means that you can also have 60 bits per second that are transmitted in that you can encode the date and the current time. After school, I went studying and I had the feeling that nothing that I learned at the Linux user group was really relevant to me. The reason is I was learning very random stuff. Let's say visual prolog. You probably never heard of this or Haskell and some other weird stuff. I was also learning compiler basics, but all of this didn't make any sense to me. I mean, of course, I passed the exams with very good grades, but it was pretty much random stuff that didn't really relate to practical jobs out there. Also, I was interested in security and almost nothing in my bachelor had to do with security. So I thought like, yeah, maybe I should get into security by doing this master of science in IT security. So I changed university for my masters. Then I learned even more random stuff again very unrelated and i thought yeah i still know nothing after a bachelor and a master maybe i stay a bit longer for a phd already sometime into my phd we had a project with a fitbit fitness tracker i joined the project because we wanted to look into the bluetooth communication of the device and back then the fitbit fitness tracker was the only one that was so secure that at least the bluetooth connection was encrypted and you couldn't just sniff all the communication so we had to figure out how it was communicating and the only way to do this when you cannot do it over the air is actually look into the fitness tracker firmware. We dumped the firmware, but then there was nobody who had the time to analyze the firmware. So one team had a person who was a specialist in this, but they just said, yeah, no, I can't. No, not this week, not the next week. It didn't happen. In our team, we had someone who was working with the Wi-Fi firmware with the next one project, Daniel, but he also didn't have the time to do it himself. So he just taught me like how the very basics work. And then I had this fitness tracker firmware loaded into IDA. Now this is a screenshot in Ghidra, but you can 
imagine it's very similar and you're just staring into a firmware without any function names. You have to name everything manually. You only have very few strings to name everything. While this sounds horrible to some people, I was like, yes, this is the thing that I like. So I stared into this for a long time and suddenly all the random things that I had learned made sense. So it kind of connected. Some stuff was about firmware, some stuff was about encryption, some stuff was about wireless communication and all the random facts that I knew came together in this firmware and made me understand certain things. Daniel helped me porting the next one, Wi-Fi firmware patching framework for the Fitbit. And with this, it was very easy to write hooks in C that would then be appended to the end of the firmware. The patch that you can see here overrides the function where a step count is retrieved. And every time this is retrieved, we multiply it with 100. So you can see I shake this Fitbit and every time steps go up by multiple of 100. This was a really nice moment for me because I realized, well, everything is open source now. It doesn't matter if there's source code or not. I can just modify what I'm interested in and analyze what I'm interested in. Of course, not so far into this project, I managed to brick a Fitbit. And how I did it was there is an over the air update protocol. I got some offsets wrong and the Fitbit ended up in a boot loop that was unrepairable without yeah, opening it and reflashing it. But in this case, I was proud that it was still in the original packing and I could just send it back. However, this is really normal. So when you go into this hardware firmware hacking area, be prepared to break your devices. And it might not just be a Fitbit, but it could be something really expensive. So much about how I learned reverse engineering, but maybe this was a little bit fast. Most of you have done forward engineering. That is, you have a source code and you compile this into a binary. In reverse engineering, you take this binary and you translate it back into the original code. Now, this is not lossless, so you have a lot of things that you need to reconstruct, and that might also be erroneous. So you wouldn't get the original C code back, just something that ideally is close to it. There are plenty of reasons why you would reverse engineer something because most software ships as binary without source code. And even if you have some source code, there's always a component that is closed source. So let's take the Linux kernel. It eventually communicates with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and those chips have firmware, which is closed source. Or you have an application and there is a third party library, which is closed source. So as soon as you want to really understand the full stack of something in the real world, you need to know how reverse engineering works. The first method that you can use for reverse engineering is static reverse engineering, for example, with Gitra. So you have a binary and each hex number here in the binary actually means some assembler instruction. So you can disassemble this binary representation into instructions. And then you can even try some heuristics to decompile the disassembly and make it human readable again. There's also dynamic analysis, which you might know from debugging. So you have a binary or a program, depending on if this is a program running on Linux or if it is firmware, it might be rebased after loading. And then during the analysis, you can, for example, disassemble it, but you could also look into arguments. So during runtime, certain functions are called with arguments. You can print them, you can change them. And this is the difference to the static reverse engineering. When you do static reverse engineering, everything is in the binary. So you could stare onto the binary for a very, very long time and eventually get back the original source code, especially when you tell the disassembler where certain struct types are and resolve object references. This might help it to really get back something very human readable. However, this is also very, very time consuming. And then there is dynamic analysis, which is faster, where you execute a binary and wait what happens. And then you can just wait what is going to be executed. So especially if you know under which conditions something is roughly executed, you might have the possibility to run the debugger and see what is happening. Now, the issue with dynamic analysis is that not everything might be called during the normal yeah, program run that you do. So let's say you have a malware. The malware 
text that it's running in a debugger and just wouldn't yeah, execute something under those circumstances, then you would never see this in the debugger unless you know where those debugger or for example virtual machine checks and so on are. That means depending on what you try to achieve, you will need different tools and you will probably use both static and dynamic analysis. One thing that I use on a daily basis is hooking. So in hooking, you try to slightly modify the binary either with static patching or with some debugger. And the goal of this could be, for example, here we have a handle transfer function where we want to transfer certain money to an account. And now we could, for example, print the arguments or the name of the account or the amount of money. Or we could also change the person the money goes to or the amount of money. Then on return, we also have a very interesting property in this function because this function either returns zero if there was no money to be transferred because the account didn't exist, or it would return the amount of money that's being transferred. So for example, we could now say transfer a million dollar and then always return zero even if it was successfully transferred. You can either set a static hook, so you patch the binary and then run it, or you can also run the binary and then patch it with a debugger. So both of this is possible and it has very similar features. It just depends on how you can actually patch the binary. My very first reverse engineering project was this Fitbit, which is a firmware. So I started with firmware reverse engineering. Now, nobody told me that reverse engineering firmware is actually challenging. And even if someone would have told me, I would have probably not believed it. So I didn't have an idea of the time scale or like how complex or easy this was. If you want to have something like an assigned difficulty, which I would recommend you, especially as a beginner, then play CTFs or some tutorials where you have an assigned difficulty level and also get a solution later on. One of the things that's difficult about firmware is that you can often not simply attach a debugger. For example, in the case of the Fitbit, yes, there were exposed debugging pins, but before you could use the debugger, you had to patch the firmware because the GPIO pins of the debugger were reconfigured. So in order to get your debugger running, you had first to statically patch the firmware, which is pretty much chicken egg because uh, usually dynamic analysis is a bit easier, but you couldn't do this without having a debugger. On modern firmware, this gets even harder. So for the Fitbit case, it was just reconfiguring some pins, but it, we were able to write the firmware. Whereas on modern devices, they often have secure boot or other security mechanisms that prevent you from simply attaching a debugger. Another issue is that most firmware that you see is 32-bit ARM. And 32-bit ARM has another really annoying property, which is that if you take a random sequence of bytes and would just try to disassemble it, then more than 99% of what you get as a random input are valid ARM instructions. Now you can say, okay, a function only starts like with a certain push instruction, for example, but that's not always the case. Functions can also start with different instructions. So it's very hard to decide where a function starts. It's also difficult to decide where a function ends because it could have multiple returns. So this bank transfer function that we had, it had two possibilities to return, but there could be even more. Now with this, we don't know where a function starts, we don't know where it ends, and even after a function end in ARM disassembly, you could have included like variables, so you could have values of variables to be used in the functions above. And this makes it really hard to decide that even at the end of a function, there is not necessarily the start of the next function, but some data in between. This makes it really hard for the disassembler and it might fail to find up to 25% of function starts. Even the best reverse engineers might reverse engineer something only to then discover it has been open source. So try to avoid the situation, look for libraries and try to find them online. Also try to get different firmware versions for your target, which might help you to figure out yeah, where some libraries come from. Here you can see a portion of a Bluetooth firmware. And in this version of the Bluetooth firmware, you can see a copyright string which says ExpressLogic ThreadX version 4. This is really important because the newer firmware versions didn't have this copyright string anymore. 
FredX is an open source real-time operating system, or I mean, I wouldn't say open source because version four was not open source, but the newer versions are. And also for this older version, you can find a documentation. Now you might ask, okay, if this is open source, why couldn't you find this earlier? Well, if you look into certain structs in the firmware, you can see they have strings that you can read backwards because we are, of course, reverse engineering. So Q backwards or thread backwards, or also some char combinations that are a bit weird, like this DVDN. And they should be pretty unique and you should be able to Google this online, right? But once you look into the FredX source code, you can see that this is not stored as a string or something, but it is stored as a little endian number with zero X in front. So it's a hex number and it's reverse byte order compared to what you see in the assembly. And for this reason, the things that we had tried to find this in Google just didn't work. Even if the real-time operating system your firmware is running on is not open source, reversing it really helps a lot. So if you find out the semantics of threads and queues and everything, you start to understand how all the components work together and which parts are interesting to further reverse engineer. Another starting point to look for open source is encryption. So Usually, cryptographic algorithms use some magic numbers, CIC32 or AES, or in the case of the Fitbit firmware, it was XT encryption. This encryption has some magic hex value that you can find in the Fitbit firmware. And even better, there's really not so many encryption libraries that support 32-bit ARM, which means you could also find the open source implementation for this one. Now, why is encryption so important? So first of all, it is easy to identify but also a lot of functionality that is security critical depends on encryption. So let's say you have the Fitbit firmware here and we know where the XT decryption is. Then there is the first thing, all the other encryption functions are very likely nearby in the firmware. So the compiler leaves this in place and we have everything nearby to be also encryption functions. Now we can also look for cross-references, which means, for example, the firmware update module might be using the decryption function and then the Bluetooth services might also access the firmware update module. So with this, you would get an idea which modules are in the firmware, in which order, and nearby functions just do very similar things. Usually when reverse engineering firmware, you wouldn't get any symbols. The reason is you have a flash and you dump the flash, so you get the firmware, which means you have the raw firmware without any packing format. So there is no more meta information that could contain symbols. So I thought for a long time, there is no way to find any symbols or also no possibility to search for symbols. But then suddenly something happened. We submitted the Bluetooth paper and reviewer two asked, hey, does it work on the latest Bluetooth firmware? And for this reason, I was just buying the latest dev kit. And two or three days later after it arrived, I was like, ooh, the dev kit has symbols. Just to link the firmware together, it contained a full list of symbols and not just the few that were needed for linking. This was super interesting and it's probably the first time to say thank you review number two. This was worth a paper revision. When you reverse engineer a firmware without symbols, you can still make a lot of guesses. So in the case of a Bluetooth firmware, you could say, hey, there is a connection struct. And in this connection struct, there is some information like the encryption key or the Bluetooth address. And we can get a pointer to this. So there is a function returning a pointer to the connection struct. Or there is a buffer that stores some LMP message. So LMP is a low level protocol for Bluetooth. And when we change the bytes in here, then also the buffer that is going to be sent will be changed. Or we also know there's a protocol HCI that is being used between the host, in our case Linux, and the controller, in our case the Bluetooth chip. And there were some vendor specific commands that we just didn't know what exactly they are doing, but we at least knew their numbers. Now with symbols, this really gets cool. So with symbols, you know, which threads are created, what their names are. We also knew that there is suddenly some Bluetooth RF registers that we can read from. 
we knew that there is a diagnostic protocol that locks the link control packets. We also knew the LMP functions and how they work together, including there was some vendor specific LMP and how this was named. And the best is we also got the names for the HCI commands. For example, there is an HCI command that is being called handle super duper peak poke. When I started reverse engineering, I looked into real world targets and this in itself is already a very huge challenge. First of all, you have to specify your own goal. So something that keeps you motivated, even for multiple months, if things are not really working out. And this should be worth your reverse engineering efforts. One of those goals could be if you have a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth chip to ask yourself if you are able to send custom data or even raw waveforms with the chip so that you have a software defined radio that you can use from the chip. Another thing could be that you try to make a wireless protocol more performant by changing, for example, something in the scheduling and then you could measure if this really makes it better without re-implementing the whole specification. It is also very interesting for security research. So Apple has a protocol, it's called magic pairing, where you only pair your AirPods once, for example, with your iPhone, and then it's being magically paired across all your devices. So for example, also your MacBook. The encryption key in Bluetooth is then synchronized between the devices and here comes the vulnerability. So you could now pick a high ratchet on one side to force the other side to calculate the key. And now if this is very high, the calculation would take very, very long. For example, you could force a MacBook to just calculate keys for almost a week with 100% CPU power. And it's very simple to test such vulnerabilities when you don't have to re-implement the full stack, but only pick a very particular part in the stack and modify it. Now, even if you specify a goal, what you're looking for might just not exist. Or maybe you're looking for a certain attack type that someone else has been testing extensively before. So you're looking for cryptographic vulnerabilities, but they are simply not there. Another thing is that real world targets are very, very large. So that means even if what you're looking for exists, you might spend a very long time finding it. However, because those targets are so large, it often happens that the bugs that are hiding in this code base are relatively simple. So it's not like in an advanced CTF where someone tries to teach you a new technique and exploitation or whatsoever. It might be very, very, very simple bugs hiding in this. When reverse engineering a real world project, nobody will tell you where to start. So you say, my expertise is this or that, and there you start, and then you make some decisions where to continue. Sometimes you might immediately find bugs, or sometimes you make the wrong decisions and don't find anything. And the worst thing is, some of those projects, they have bug bounties, so multiple people look into them, and it might just happen that another researcher just posts on Twitter like, hey, I just found a vulnerability in here and you're like, I have been staring under this for months, really? Oh no, how can that happen? Only few people talk about this, but it really happens. If you want to get started with reverse engineering, there are many great resources out there. My first recommendation would be do not start with firmware. It is really hard. Try something easier like Windows or Android applications. For Windows applications, I can recommend to you the page begin.re, where you can reverse engineer Minesweeper and then hack it for your ultimate score. And there's also a course on reverse engineering Android apps, which are written in Java and also have some native libraries. So you can uncover certain malware functionality in there, which is really, really interesting. And the most important tip is don't give up staring. It's totally normal to lose hours and hours and hours during reverse engineering.